Today I want to share with you how to make pork bone broth. It's very easy to do, it's delicious, and it's wonderful for your skin. Hi sweet friends, I'm Mary and welcome to Mary's Nest, where I teach traditional cooking skills for making nutrient-dense foods like bone broth, ferments, sourdough, and more. So if you enjoy learning about those things, consider subscribing to my channel. And don't forget to click on the little notification bell below. That'll let you know every time I upload a new video. Now today for making pork bone broth, I'm using smoked ham hocks. I love the flavor that these impart, but you can certainly use ham shanks if you can't find ham hocks. But the only difference is you might find that the ham shank, it's, it's a very similar cut. It's a little meatier than the ham hock, but it's from the same part of the ham, uh, of the ham from the pig down uh, near the foot. Um, but the ham shank may not have the skin on. And that's why I like to use ham hocks, because the, this skin is loaded with collagen. And it's going to make a very rich gelatinous broth. And the collagen that's in the skin is very good for our skin. And the fact that these are smoked really imparts a wonderful flavor to the bone broth, and it makes it terrific for using in bean soups, where you want, like, enjoy that sort of, sort of nice smoky ham flavor. And it's also very tasty just for drinking straight, as I have a girlfriend who describes it as drinking liquid bacon. And the nice thing about having these smoked uh, in comparison to when you're making beef bone broth, you don't need to put these in the oven, brown them. You can totally skip that step, which makes this a quicker process. Now today we're going to make this in the slow cooker. You know, if you've seen any of my other bone broth videos, uh, which I'll uh, link to some of them in the iCards, and I'll also put a, a link to the playlist in the description below, because I have a lot of videos on chicken bone broth, beef bone broth, fish bone broth, turkey bone broth. So uh, if that interests you, you can check that out. But uh, I really like making bone broths in the slow cooker. And I've also done the stove top and I've done the instant pot and all of that. Uh, but I really like the slow cooker. So I'm going to do today's pork bone broth in the slow cooker. Uh, but the rules or the rules, the instructions, so to speak, uh, are the same if you want to do it on the stove top. Now, if you do it in the Instant Pot, it's a little different. Today, with pork bone broth, uh, it's best simmered in the slow cooker or on the stove top for about four to six hours. Oops. <laughs> Uh, in the Instant Pot, however, you'll want to uh, cook it on low pressure, whether you have a 6-quart or an 8-quart. Uh, just, you know, stay under your fill line uh, in the insert that goes into your Instant Pot. And you'll want to cook it for two hours on the low pressure setting. Uh, I learned this by calling Instant Pot. If you've seen my beef bone broth video in the Instant Pot or my chicken bone broth video in the Instant Pot, I called Instant Pot and uh, learned a lot about how to make a really good bone broth in it, in the Instant Pot, that uh, will come out gelatinous. And that's where I learned about cooking it on low pressure. So, but for today, we're going to go ahead and put our ham hocks, and I've got a little over four pounds. This is about an eight quart slow cooker, so whenever I make any kind of bone broth in here, I generally like to have uh, about four pounds of whatever bones and meaty bones, whatever I'm using. Um, this is a little bit over, you know, it's never exact measurement, but that's, so if you're doing this in a six quart slow cooker, you'd want about three pounds of ham hocks or ham shanks, whatever you're using. If you've got a larger uh, slow cooker, uh, you might see sometimes I use a 10 quart slow, slow cooker, uh, then you'd probably want to go with about five pounds of the ha uh, ham hocks or the ham shanks. Now to help draw out the collagen that's in the skin and in the, in the bones here, right here, see so here are your bones, um, you've got some cartilage here, and then of course the skin. 
in order to draw out the maximum amount of collagen, uh, which is going to help make your bone, uh, bone broth gelatinous. And why do we want to make it gelatinous? Because the gelatin, gelatin is basically cooked collagen, uh, is very nourishing. It's nourishing for our skin and our nails, our hair, and it's very soothing to our gut lining. So we want to draw out as much collagen as we can. And the best way to do that is by acidulating the water. And you can certainly do that with some vinegar. Apple cider vinegar is nice. Um, I'm not a 100% fan of the taste of using apple cider vinegar. And uh, if you put too much in it, it, it can linger uh, in the finished product. So if you want to use apple cider vinegar, then I recommend in an eight quart stock pot, only going with about a quarter of a cup. Uh, I prefer to use some type of wine or fortified wine. Uh, this is a fortified wine. This is some Marsala. You can use Madeira. You can use Port. Uh, you can use red vermouth. You can use white vermouth. Uh, you can also use regular wine, red wine or white wine, whatever you have on hand. I like the fortified wines because they just have a screw chop. You know, they're fortified uh, with some uh, sugar uh, that makes them more of a sweet wine, but they come with a screw top and they don't uh, tend to get an off flavor the way an open bottle of wine would. If you have some wine and you open it and you don't drink it and you put it in your pantry, at some point it may turn to vinegar. But the fortified wines uh, you can keep long term, which is nice if, if you don't drink. I don't drink wine, so uh, I wouldn't you know, have a, a bottle on hand. But if you do and you've got a little extra and you can throw it in, that's fine too. But I'm going to go ahead and add in this fortified wine. As I said, um, this is Marsala. Now I'm going to go ahead and cover this with water. And you want to cover just enough. I'm going to move these around a little just get them submerged. I want to cover just enough water and what I'm going to do, I'm going to get a little more water because they're sticking out a little bit, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to let these soak for about an hour. And the reason that I like to do that, I like to let them soak in acidulate whatever bones, I'm, whether I'm doing this with uh, pork or beef or chicken bones, I like to let them soak for about an hour in the acidulated water before I turn the heat on because I feel this gives them a little jump start as the, as the water that has the acid in it starts to leach out the collagen. So it gives it a little jump start before we put the heat on. Now as these soak, I just want to discuss something. What if you can't find ham hocks or you can't find ham shanks? What else can you do? You can certainly use any ham bones that you have. You can use bones left over from maybe making ribs, or you can use, uh, the, if you get a ham and you've got a bone in ham, and maybe sometimes you'll have the butcher pull out the bone and you'll stuff the pocket and you'll be left with that bone, or maybe you'll cook your ham on the bone, whatever the case may be, you can save that bone and you can certainly use that bone to make uh, pork bone broth. You can use any pork bones that you have. The reason that I like the ham hocks, as I said earlier, is because of the skin on them, which really helps make it nice and richly gelatinous. But yes, you can use any ham bones. And if you make pork chops and, you, and they're bone on pork chops, save those bones, use those to make bone broth. You can make a mixture. You could have one or two ham hocks. Um, or one or two ham shanks, or a hock and a shank, and a couple of rib bones, or the bone uh, from the bone in ham. Any mixture will work, and it's going to make you a nice, flavorful broth. Now the next thing that we're going to do, now this is going to be very flavorful because these are smoked, but I still like to add vegetables. And I'm not so much adding them for the flavor as I am for their mineral content. Because bone broth, any bone broth, is very rich in collagen but it's really the vegetables that you add that increase its mineral content. So the more vegetables you add to your bone broth, the more mineral rich it will be. And I usually just like a very basic mixture. Some onions, leave the skins on. They're, they add color, flavor, and nutrition. Celery, I've got just the bottom piece of my celery. You know, this can really be a clean out the crisper kind of thing when you make bone broth. I've got some leaves from the celery. I've got carrots, you know, skins on. 
nothing fancy. Uh, another uh, good ingredient, you can add any kind of, anything in the onion family, scallions, leeks. Uh, you can also add um, lettuce. Uh, romaine lettuce is very good for adding. So really look in your crisper and, and see what you have. The only thing that I'd recommend that you not add are your cruciferous vegetables. And for two reasons. One, they can have a strong flavor that can be off-putting in the final product. And secondly, um, as you've probably heard me, if you watch my channel, you may have heard me discuss this before, that uh, cruciferous vegetables are very high in goitrogens. And goitrogens can be a little hard on the thyroid. And if you want to eat cruciferous vegetables, they're best cooked and then discard the water. And then they have less burden on your thyroid. Uh, so you wouldn't want to put them in raw into a bone broth and then your broth would be rich in the goitrogens, especially if you drink it on a regular basis. So you don't want to do that. But uh, your onions, anything in the onion family, celery, carrots, as I said, some of the lettuces uh, like romaine are all wonderful uh, choices. Now, about garlic, because I get asked this question a lot. I never add garlic to my bone broth. The reason is I like to add it after the fact if I'm using my bone broth in a recipe that calls for garlic. I find that when you simmer garlic a long time in a bone broth, especially like a beef bone broth, which you simmer for 12 hours, it can develop an off-putting flavor. So I always leave the garlic out. Then when I'm ready to drink the bone broth or use it in a recipe and I want to put some garlic in it, that's the time when I add the garlic. Now, you can add other herbs and spices at this point if you want. Uh, again, I like to leave my bone broth pretty simple uh, because I don't know 100% what type of recipes I'll be using it in. Although I do sometimes make anti-inflammatory bone broths and I'll put a link in the uh, iCards and, and in the description below in, uh, that'll be in the bone broth playlist that I have that I'll put down there. And then I'll put in garlic, not garlic, I'll put in turmeric and I'll fresh turmeric if you find it at the market, uh, f uh, fresh ginger, um, different herbs that have, you know, good healing properties and so on and so forth. But I know that I'm specifically making that to be used as, to drink as an anti-inflammatory bone broth. They're wonderful to make in the wintertime. Uh, with this, the ham hocks are gonna be very flavorful. These will add some minerals and this will be perfect. So I'll go ahead and just start adding all of this in right on top. And the next thing, I always like to add in a few bay leaves, no matter what type of bone broth I'm, I'm baking. And then just a few black peppercorns. Nothing fancy and again, Nothing about this is precise. I think I had about two onions, you know, some celery scraps, a couple of onion uh, carrots that were kind of coming past a little past their prime. All of that type of stuff is perfect for a bone broth. And you don't need to, as I said, don't peel anything, nothing. Just put it right on in and it'll be perfect. Now I'm just going to add a little bit more water. Uh, the enemy of bone broth is too much water. You do not want to add too much water. You really, if some of the veggies are uh, popping out a little, that's fine. And I'll, I'll take a picture and overlay it so you can see uh, how my water is in this slow cooker. And I want to stay at least an inch away from the rim because as it uh, cooks throughout the day, I don't want there to be <laughs> any uh, overflow. I've had that happen sometimes. So a little tip, stay about an inch below because as things start to bubble and whatnot, you can get a little overflow. But don't put too much water, just enough water to cover, and that's going to be perfect. Now what I like to do when I make bone broth in the slow cooker is to turn this up to high and then if I can it'll come up to a little uh, boil some scum will come to the top I can scoop that off and then I turn it down to keep warm and the reason I like keep warm is in this slow cooker keep warm is 180 degrees Fahrenheit and that's the perfect temperature for making bone broth now what if on high, it seems to take forever for your slow cooker to come up to a bit of a bubbling boil? 
I've heard from some of you that, you know, every slow cooker is different. And I've heard from some of you that hours later, you're still looking at your slow cooker and it's not coming up to a bit of a boil where there's some scum that you can remove. Don't worry about it. Keep it on high for about an hour. That's going to bring it up to a good temperature. And then either turn it to low or keep warm whatever setting you have on your slow cooker and whatever setting may be using a little food thermometer checking it that registers 180 degrees Fahrenheit. As it simmers in the slow cooker you can check it periodically uh, throughout the day and if you see any foam on top you can just remove it then. On the stove it's a little different. You should be able to bring it up to a boil but the minute it comes up to a boil, you know, as I've shared in bone broth, and the same if you have a slow cooker, that'll bring it up to the bo a boil. The minute it does, boom, turn it down to low or keep warm, whatever setting you have. And if you're doing it on the stovetop, the minute it comes up to a boil, immediately remove it from the heat. Or if you, that's if you have an electric stove. If you have a gas stove, just turn your burner immediately down to low. And if you have a uh, electric stove, then just let it cool down, turn it to low, and then you, once it's cooled down to low, you can put your stock pot back on that burner. And with it coming up to the boil, some foam will come, it's called scum, will come to the top and you can remove that. But you don't want to boil your bone broth. Boiling bone broth is the enemy of collagen and it can I've shared this terminology with you in the past, it can kind of break the collagen, meaning that collagen can withstand certain temperatures over 180 degrees. And there's all kinds of collagen in uh, bones and the skin and the cartilage, uh, but it, it's not wise to keep it boiling for extended periods of time because it, it in essence can damage the collagen and that can create a less gelatinous bone broth. However, that said, don't worry if when you test your slow cooker, you find that it, it can't go as low as 180 degrees Fahrenheit. 180, 190, 200 degrees Fahrenheit, it's going to be okay. It's, you know, collagen can withstand a little higher temperatures. Uh, so don't worry if you can't get that exact temperature. And the same on the stovetop. If you find even on your lowest setting it's a little higher than 180, don't worry about it. It's going to be fine. Basically what you're looking for is that it's low enough, where, whether it's in the slow cooker or on the stovetop, that you're basically just seeing little bubbles coming up at you know, little intervals from little intervals apart. Basically, as I've described it to you in the past, bloop, bloop, <laughs> like that. And if you're doing this in the slow cooker, uh, not the slow cooker, in the Instant Pot, that's why Instant Pot, when I called them and asked them about making bone broth, advised uh, keeping the pressure setting on low as opposed to high because the pressure setting on low heats the contents to obviously a lower temperature than if it's on high pressure. And it's a little over 200, but it's not too bad. And as you'll see, uh, if you watch any of those videos, I am able to get a relatively nice gelatinous broth, a bone broth uh, from it. Not as gelatinous as what I can get out of the slow cooker and out of the and and from the stovetop and I think that's because of the higher temperature and so there are probably certain collagens that are more susceptible to that higher temperature than other collagens but there's still enough in there uh, that can withstand that heat but again only for the two hour period and so I was getting somewhat gelatinous uh, bone broth. So that's something to keep in mind. Well, anyways, I've got this on high. We'll bring this up to high and then I'll immediately turn it down to keep warm. I'm going to let this simmer for somewhere between four and six hours. And then I'll show you how we strain it and decant it. Well, I brought this up to temp on high uh, for about one hour and then I turned it down to keep warm and I let it simmer for about six hours. And now we're all ready to strain it. Now the first thing that I'm going to do is just get out these vegetables. 
and they pretty much are all used up. Uh, so it's your choice how you want to, what you want to handle doing with them. Uh, some people have told me they rinse them very well so that there isn't any uh, grease on them and then they put them in their compost pile. So that's a wonderful idea. And now we'll take the ham hocks out. And they are literally, I mean, it's just falling, the meat is just falling off the bone tender. So you have a couple of options. You can eat the meat or you can reuse it uh, to make another batch of bone broth. Uh, and you definitely would want to add, here is the skin from, from the hocks. You definitely want to add in that skin in the event that there is, whoops, <laughs> in the event that there is more collagen that can be released from that. It's certainly worth a try. Um, but the meat would be uh, wonderful to chop up and put in a ham soup. I think that would be just delicious. Now, yes, there is just some lovely fat that is still in here that hasn't completely dissolved. I'm just trying to fish it out here for you, but you can see there's a lot of fat. And here I've got out some of the bones, and I'll take a close-up picture so you can see. And this skin still seems to have a lot of texture left to it. So I would definitely try a second batch of the pork bone broth with the bones, with the skin, and then with all of the fat. And the reason that I add the fat, there's nutrition in it, of course, but then as it cooks down, it rises to the top, and you'll see when we strain this and cool it, and you can skim that off and then save that for cooking. It's wonderful to cook with. And this meat looks wonderful. Uh, this I would chop up and put in a soup, or as I mentioned earlier, a bean soup would be wonderful. Or you could chop it up with some spices and uh, put it into tacos. That might be real fun. And I'll give it a taste and I'll see how it is after the six hours, but it literally was just falling off the bone tender. Mmm. <laughs> oh, it's delicious. And the flavor from the smoked ham hocks is absolutely wonderful and it's so tender. Now at this point for the broth you've got a couple of options. You can transfer this to a bowl or another pot, whatever the case may be, and refrigerate it as is. In the morning the next day uh, all of the little bits of debris that I wasn't able to get out perfectly with just straining using the, the hand strainer will sink to the bottom the fat will rise to the top and congeal. You can remove that and then you can scoop out your bone broth, which will be very gelatinous, and then discard the little bits of debris that are left over on the bottom. That's one way. But those of you who have probably seen some of my other bone broth videos know that I like to go through a few uh, additional steps before I refrigerate it. And I'll show you what I do. What I like to do is get some kind of vessel. I'm just using a measuring cup, a glass measuring cup here so that you can see exactly what I'm doing. Uh, and then I get, like to get a strainer. And then on top of the strainer, I like to put uh, a flour sack towel. This is just like a very, very thin dish towel. And you can also use cheesecloth if you want. I like this because they're reusable and wash up beautifully. And uh, I'll definitely put a link below uh, to, to where I find these. Uh, you can find them at big box stores. Um, pretty much all of them carry them and they're also on Amazon. So if that's something that you like to have instead of having to use cheesecloth, which has gotten a little costly and really maybe only after one or two uses, you know, it's got to be discarded. But these work great. So what I like to do is put these over the strainer or put this over the strainer and then I like to scoop out my broth. I'm just going to bring this a little closer actually so I don't drip any. And then I like to strain this through the cheesecloth. And then I'll show you why I like to do this. This is going to collect all those little bits of debris that uh, are still sort of floating around in the broth. Now they would sink to the bottom if you refrigerate this, but when you discard the debris, there is still a little bit of broth mixed in there. And those of you who know me know I don't like to waste. So I like to take this step to get every possible little bit of broth uh, out of this batch. 
So I just want to show you, this is what I'm collecting in here. You'll see it's just a little bit of debris. Now at this point, with the fat still in there, uh, you can store this in different ways. I take one more step to defat the bone broth, but I want to show you what you can do first if you want to leave the fat on top there. If you want to store it in, say, a half gallon jar like this, if you think you're going to use it relatively quickly, uh, within a week or two, you know, with the fat on top, it makes somewhat, not perfect, but somewhat of an airtight seal that helps keep it a little fresher. You can just go ahead right now at this point and pour that right into your jar. If you want other jars that I like to use, uh, this holds about two cups and this one holds about one cup. Uh, I'll put links to these below. Um, you can also search for these. They're at most of the cooking stores sell them. You might even see them at your grocery store. And uh, they're usually called like uh, uh, French working glasses or French jelly jars, something like that. And the reason that I like these over canning jars is that the lid is plastic. So even though I do leave plenty of headspace if I want to freeze these, uh, if it does expand beyond the amount of headspace that I leave, all it does is push off the plastic top. And there's no fanfare. They've never broken on me. And I've been freezing in these for years. So that's why I like these. But I know some of you have told me you've had good luck uh, freezing in canning jars as long as you use the wide mouth and leave plenty of uh, headspace. But I know some of you have also said that you have had some jars break. So <laughs> it's not... Uh, uh, it's not something that I generally do, but I just wanted you to know that uh, some people have had success with that. So those are the two options. You can just go ahead and store a big, if you think you're going to use a lot, you can do that. If you think you'd use it in two cup measures or one cup measures, whatever the case may be. And you can just go ahead and pour that right in. Now, when you go to use it, it's up to you. If you want to remove the fat, it'll be hard and congealed at that point, and then save that for cooking, or add it into your recipe, whatever you want to do. But I like to take the next step, which involves using a fat separator. And this one I love. <laughs> this is such a clever little gadget, because it's got a lever here and a hole down here on the bottom. And you pour your bra through here, or whatever you're using, and you let the fat rise to the top, and then you just press the lever and the broth that now has the fat on top strains through and when you see it get down to the fat line you just stop and i love this to me this is such a modern <laughs> invention compared to the old fat separators that you may remember had the um uh, like a spout down here and it was always difficult to to keep from getting any at least for me getting any fat into the broth but in any event, what I like to do, rather than just storing it right in here with the fat or in one of the one or two cup measures, I like to go ahead and just pour this right into the fat separator. And then I'll show you, got a little extra there, but I don't want to overfill it. What will happen is the fat will start to rise to the top and there'll be a little line of fat here. And I'll take a picture, an up-close picture, and, and uh, overlay it so that you can see what I'm talking about. And then, the next step, I just like to take this right over my jar. And I'm going to put uh, the bulk of this into a half-gallon jar because I am going to use this actually to make a soup. So I'm going to use this amount. And then whatever I have left, I'll store in the smaller jars in the freezer. And then the nice thing about bone broth whether it's pork bone broth, beef bone broth, chicken bone broth, wherever you think you might use water, you can use a cup or two cups of your bone broth. I use it when I cook grains, when I make rice. It's, it's really very versatile and comes in handy, and of course, always when making a soup. So here we go. See, and then that'll be nice and defatted. And then as I get closer to that fat line, I just stop. I remove my hand off the lever, and then I'll decant that fat into a different container. I'm just going to take a little bit of this, and I'm going to put it in a glass. And then I'm going to go ahead and put this in the refrigerator and let it chill so we can see how gelatinous it turned out. Well, this is wonderful. I've got about a little more than a half a gallon of uh, pork bone broth in here. I've got two cups in here and about a half a cup in here. And I just put a little in a bowl here. I'm gonna take a taste, I'll let you know how it is. 
Mmm. Oh, that's so good. It's got that nice sort of smoky, uh, sweet taste. That's delightful. It's going to be perfect for uh, using for bean soups, and I think it's going to be really nice uh, when making grains. Now let's go check on that one in the fridge and see how gelatinous it came. Well, I cleaned up my kitchen and let this chill in the fridge in the meantime, and look at how gelatinous this is. Can you believe it? It came glorious. See, I really think it's, there's so much collagen in that pig skin. I'll take a close-up picture so that you can see how gelatinous this is. Just glorious. So I hope you'll give pork bone broth a try. And if you'd like to learn more about traditional nutrient-dense cooking, be sure to subscribe to my channel. And then click on this video over here where I have a playlist of all types of bone broth, chicken, beef, fish, you name it, and in different appliances, including the Instant Pot. And I'll see you over there in my Texas Hill Country kitchen. Love and God bless.